in the name of God, uh, In the name of God, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, in the name of God. Yeah. Hi. Okay. Thank you. Uh, hello and very welcome to all participants today. Uh, I am Fateh Muradi Niaz the expert at studies in educational innovations and training department. And it's very good opportunity for me to host today this uh, great panel as a moderator. Uh, today we have a joint discussion uh, regarding title, internationalization of higher education a sharing and discussion session between Iran and Malaysia. Uh, today, uh, we wanted to focus more on internationalization of higher education in both countries. So we have uh, three Nobel lecturers today uh, from uh, both countries, Dr. And Nasrin Nushahi, the head of the Institute of Research and Planning in Higher Education, Dr. Datu Moshidi, professor and founding director of Commonwealth Tertiary, and uh, Dr. Said Ismail Musavi, a faculty member of the Institute for Research and at the uh, Institute for Research and Planning in Higher Education. Very welcome to all of you and all participants, uh, ranging from faculty members to students and so on. Uh, before and initially, I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Nushahi, Nasim Nushahi, the president of the Institute for Research and Planning in Higher Education to, uh, to has an introductory uh, speech regarding the institution, its structure and objectives and etc. cetera. Uh, Dr. Nushahi is president of the Institute for Research and Planning in Higher Education in Iran. She holds a PhD from Sheikh Beshti University in Educational Management. Her research focus including comparative study in higher education, analyzing higher education indicators, planning in higher education, and leadership and management in higher education. She also published papers in journals such as Quarterly Journal of Research and Planning in Higher Education and Journal of Higher Education Letter. She collaborates as a reviewer, as an editorial board with some journals as well. So initially, I want to ask Dr. Nushahi to have uh, to have an introductory speech. Pass to you, Dr. Nushahi, please. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Fateh. Uh, in the name of God, uh, and salam alaikum, alza salam, khidmate hame mehmanan arjman, hello and welcome. I'm very happy to uh, participate in this useful and important meeting, a meeting with colleagues uh, from friendly Malaysia, uh, and welcome to Professor uh, Siro. Uh, I'm going to introduce you to the Institute for Research and Planning in Higher Education. Please next. The Institute for Research and Planning in Higher Education, IRPHD, was established in 1969 to help improve and enhance quality and content of scientific and educational programs in all educational levels in Iran. But uh, in 1819, the Development Council 
for higher education, the Ministry of Science put on an agenda to establish an institute to study the development policies of the quantity and quality in higher education in law of the first program of economic, social and cultural development of Iran. And thus, the Institute for Research and Planning in Higher Education took this responsibility. Please, next. Uh, we have objectives in this institution include uh, publish and transfer knowledge among stakeholders in higher education, quantitative and qualitative development of research in the field of higher education with an emphasis on the production of indigenous knowledge. Increase capabilities and capacity to convert research findings to policy paths with a future approach. Organizational innovation to achieve goals and missions. Please next. Also, uh, we have uh, six uh, research departments include Department of Economics of Higher Education and Manpower, Department of Comparative Studies in Higher Education, uh, Planning in Higher Education, Statistical Research and Information Technology, Higher Education Management Studies, and the Department of Studies in Educational Innovation and Training. We are as a team fund, uh, we've done more than 400 research projects in line with objectives of Ministry of Science, Research and Technology, which has been used in fields of policy and planning in higher education. We conduct supportive studies, policy research, and policy evaluation in higher education. Uh, for international cooperation of IRPHD, uh, we know that a very important issue in the scientific community is the need to enter the process of internationalization of higher education. IRPHD programs and activities for international cooperation include collaboration with international organizations, signing of memorandum of understanding and agreement, establishment of joint research program, organization of joint meetings and discussion, decision, uh, organization of joint workshops, doing projects about internationalization of higher education, uh, mutual visits of faculty members with partner institutions, publishing research papers in international journals, participating at international conferences, encouraging faculty members for international uh, collaboration. And we have a UNESCO chair, UNESCO chair in management, planning and quality assurance. UNESCO chair in management, planning and quality assurance in higher education established in uh, 2008 at the Institute for Research and Planning in Higher Education. The main goals of this trail are evaluation and development of the policy making, planning and management in higher education, establishment of institutional research, IR, institutionalizing higher education quality assurance promoting the level of higher education in the regional and international interactions. Looking at the status uh, of article international journals, we have had good growth between uh, 2013 and 2019. You see. And uh, we have had good growth between 2013 and 2017, 
for papers presented at international conferences. Uh, in COVID-19 pandemic, IRPHD reorganized its activities to coordinate its decisions with national committees on combating coronavirus. The main activity carried out by IRPHD during the COVID-19 crisis regarding international cooperation are holding digital meetings and discussions uh, sessions publishing research papers in the field of internationalization of higher education, publishing a book titled Internationalization of Higher Education, A New Look, Transformational Steps, doing research about international students' expectations of higher education during COVID-19. Uh, we know that uh, Thank you for your attention, and uh, I have a question uh, for uh, opening the discussion. Uh, we know that uh, Malaysia higher education has had a successful experience in uh, internationalization. Uh, I have a question from a professor. Uh, what do you think are the reasons for this success? Uh, and you know that we have made good efforts in Iran in recent years, but still in the first place. Do you have any suggestions for improving this for us? Thank you for asking. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Nushahi. Thank you for your introductory uh, speech. Uh, uh, to the second lecturer, you uh, raise a very important uh, question that uh, later I will uh, ask uh, Dr. Datu Moshidi to um, give some kindness and answers about the question. And the second lecture here is a very great and a noble uh, professor, Datu Moshidi. Uh, from Malaysia. Dr. Moshi, uh, Moshidi, I am hopeful that uh, pronounce the uh, name correctly, is a professor and founding director of Commonwealth Tertiary Education Facility in Malaysia and a senior research fellow at the National Higher Education, uh, Higher Education Research Institute. He also he has also served as the Director General of Higher Education, Ministry of Education of Malaysia, and as the Director of the IPPTN. For the second lecture, I like to ask Mr. Datu Moshidi to uh, present their uh, speech. Okay. Uh, Dr. Fatih Moradinias, uh, our operator for the session this afternoon. Um, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. And a very good morning or afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, it is a great pleasure um, to be involved in this forum today. And I must congratulate IRP HE for this uh, interesting initiative. And thank you to the president of RPHE for inviting me to speak at this forum. You're welcome. I, I, yeah. Um, can, can, can you hear me um, good on the other side? Perfect. Perfect, yeah, because we are we're having some rain on this side, so uh, there may be an intermittent uh, problem with, with uh, reception, yeah? Uh, if you don't hear me well, please uh, let me know. Otherwise, I'll be talking and talking with uh, uh, you not having to get uh, what I'm saying on that. Okay, let me know if you have problem with uh, transmission. Okay, um, the title of my presentation today is Malaysia's Internationalization of Higher Education Disruption. Uh, some thoughts on recovery. Um, Next slide, please. Well, I have several bullet points um, for my presentations. 
Um, I'll start with some of the rationale of internationalization of education in Malaysia and how do you uh, investigate uh, internationalization of higher education in the context of a country level such as Malaysia or could even be uh, relevant in the case of uh, Iran. Yeah? Um, and what are the domains of internationalization of higher education? Mobility obviously is one of them. There are so many other domains within the, the bigger ambit, the bigger framework of internationalization of higher education. And uh, as I said earlier, there's so many domains, but I'm, I wouldn't be able to, to uh, go through all the domains of internationalization in this uh, short time that we have today. So I'll be concentrating on a couple of bullet points on that, probably one or two elements of that domain. Not everything, but probably two, uh, depending on the time that we have. And then looking at uh, one of our success, uh, earlier on the president was asking what are the success factors uh, contributing to internationalization of higher education in Malaysia. One was uh, relevant, to, one which is relevant to the success is the establishment of an international education hub that I will, I will uh, talk a little bit. But more importantly, more importantly in this presentation today, all the discussion on the successes of Malaysian, uh, of Malaysia's inter internationalization of higher education has no meaning anymore today because of the disruption. So I will not be talking quite a lot on our success because success has has been disrupted uh, because of um, COVID-19 and the pandemic. So I'll be speaking more on the recovery rather than the, the, rather than the success. Sorry. We lost you, doctor. Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, for, for a short time, we lost your voice. Yeah, putting on the video cam on. Okay, right, let me continue. Thank you. Um, so I'll be, I'll be speaking more on the disruption uh, and what we are looking forward from here on. Uh, success has been recorded, has been uh, recognized, but it is not going to hold true for quite a while now because of pandemic. So I'll talk about disruption and I talk, I will talk about the future of internationalization of higher education in Malaysia uh, from now uh, to the future. Uh, what does that mean uh, in context of the future in terms of the relation between Malaysia and Iran uh, with respect to the development of internationalization of higher education, how can we move forward? What are the things that we need uh, that we need to look into uh, in order to uh, further develop the relationship uh, between Iran and Malaysia in the context of higher education? Okay, so I will speak more on that rather than success. So introduction: What and why of internationalization of higher education? Uh, in the context of Malaysia and the world over. Uh, internationalization, internationalization is not a new thing, but since 1990, it has become something that's very important because there are so many new ideas coming in and there is no single definition of internationalization. So there is uh, a continuous uh, academic exchange on reinterpretation repackaging the function of internationalization of higher education uh, in many parts of the world. But one thing we must agree is that internationalization of higher education is a Western construct. I've not seen uh, any construct that's basically Islamic or Eastern uh, in context. It is basically a Western idea. It is a Western construct. And because of that, our internationalization Policy is very much influenced by um, uh, a traditional flow from the south to the north. I mean, we send students to the UK, the US, 
the European countries because internationalization is a Western construct uh, based on the bias of the Western thinking of how flow should be. It is between the south to the north. But recently, we have arguments about global not uh, that uh, flow to the south on, and even a south south flow in terms of uh, mobility. But even then, uh, even if uh, in the context of south south or even north to south, it is still a Western con uh, construct. It would be, be nice if we can think in terms of uh, Islamic construct, in terms of an uh, Eastern construct when we deal with a mobility in the context of the South and the South or within the Islamic countries uh, themselves. Yeah. Um, but going to the literature and even in context of Malaysia, we will see the predominant economic rationale in the South for for um, for uh, mobility, for internationalization of higher education. But within that economic rationale, for the purpose of economic generation, income generation, they have embedded intercultural awareness, regional competencies. This is true in the context of regional associations such as, such as ASEAN, for example. Now, when we want to study uh, internationalization of higher education, there are four uh, aspects that we can, we can look at. We can base our research, our uh, investigation into internationalization of higher education based on first, a neoliberalism. That means internationalization is about market orientation. That means we depend on the market to generate income for the country, for the economy, national economy, and even, even for the universities that are involved in international student mobility, for example. So this, this is what I meant by neoliberalism, market orientation, revenue, income generating element of internationalization. The second bullet is about soft power. This is about um, government to government arrangement between two countries, Malaysia and Iran, for example. It's not about money. It's not about income generation, but it's about um, people to people relationship. It's about understanding between two countries. It's about how Malaysia is attracting uh, students from Iran because when they come to Malaysia, they can underst understand uh, regional intercultural competencies. It's not about money. It's about diplomacy in higher education. And thirdly, is global citizenship. It's about uh, cross-cultural awareness and employable capacity. Okay, it's about understanding between region, between countries in the East, Far East, in the Middle East, in the Southeast Asia. And it's about employability. I mean, students in the East, in the Far East or Middle East, when they study in Malaysia, for example, because they're exposed to region, the Malaysian culture, they are able to get employment in the Malaysian private sector, for instance. Yeah? And the thirdly is internationalization at home. How do you engage the university curriculum in order to accept internationalization, in order to uh, inculcate regional understanding? Yeah? So these are the four theoretical lenses that you can use in, in order to investigate in, uh, internationalization of higher education. Next, please. Now, what are the domains of uh, internationalization? Uh, I, will, I will say there are two basic domains. One is system-wide regulatory regimes and, policy, uh, and policy framework. The second domain is institutional level programs and initiative. Yeah? So under institutional level programs and initiative, you have student mobility, outbound, inbound, academic staff mobility, academic and academic related programs and activities, cross-border higher education provision and delivery, and internationalization at home and of the program. These are the main domains and the subdomain. I will not be talking about all these domains. I will concentrate on a few only. Yeah? I will concentrate on a few only where we can sh uh, share the success of, of Malaysia. Yeah? Next, please. So in this pre presentation, first, I will provide a cursory overview only, not a detailed analysis of what's going on in Malaysia, just an overview of what have happened in the past and what are the achievements today. Yeah? Uh, 
um, which is relevant to the question by the president earlier on. And second question, second objective is, I want to focus more on the future. What needs resetting? What aspect of internationalization in Malaysia that needs recalibration? Yeah, because of disruption. And I would like to provide some thoughts on the recovery for Malaysian higher, higher, uh, internationalization of higher education and in terms of recovery in the context of the relationship between Malaysia and Iran in higher education development and student mobility. And thirdly, um, um, back please. Uh, yeah, to highlight what are the future for Malaysia because of the disruption. Yeah, the, the future to me lies in government to government arrangement. Yeah, um, you cannot you cannot leave it to the student alone uh, to decide where to go because they may not they may not have the complete information. So soft power is very important in this context. Or you can you can say it is mutual power platform between Malaysia and Iran in order to develop a proper healthy student mobility program within this between these two countries. So this presentation, I will concentrate on two things, a couple of things only, not everything. One is regu regulatory regime, policy framework. Two is institutional level program and initiative. And three, international student mobility inbound, not outbound, because first, documentation um, is very sketchy in many instances. And three, uh, we don't have proper statistics that we can rely on. So. System, yes, we have full documentation, good documentation. Institutional level program initiative, yes, we have the documentation for this. And international student mobility, yes, this is centrally collected and verified. Those coming into Malaysia, we know where they are, who they are, where they're going to, and what uh, they are doing. They are good statistics for this, yeah? But going out, we cannot guarantee that the data is reliable. Next, please. So if you look at the regulatory regime and policy framework um, in the Malaysian higher education system, uh, you have the blueprint, uh, which is the official document of higher education development and strategies. And you have the regulatory regime, which is the act, and uh, that needs to be uh, in place in order to move forward higher education agenda. I will concentrate on a few of these. Yeah? This is the overall. Uh, relating to higher education, but I will focus on a few that has specific concern or uh, relevant to internationalization of higher education. Next, please. So first, that's relevant to internationalization of higher education is the Private Higher Education Institution, Educational Institution Act of 1996, which is Act 5. Five, five. This allows the establishment of private higher education institutions. This allows the recruitment of international students. This allows um, the, the export of higher education uh, to many countries uh, in many parts of the world. So because of this act, we see um, um, a growth of private higher education institutions in Malaysia based on 1996 act. And this is one of the basis of uh, what I'll refer to later as the Malaysia International Education Hub. Yeah. Next, please. And then in 22007, we have the National Higher Education Strategic Plan beyond 2020, where we formulate the future higher education landscape until 2020. We have the policy, we have the framework uh, in order to develop our higher education system so that it is a very attractive, very systematic, and very reliable higher education system in this part of the world, which can attract international students. Next, please. Because of the uh, National Higher Education Strategic Plan and because of Private Higher Education Institute, Private Higher Education uh, Act, yeah, Act 5.5, we have established, we have implemented, we have launched international, internationalization policy for higher, education, uh, for higher education in Malaysia in 2011, where we established the idea of the hub, um, but the hub is a, something that's laid out within the context of competition, 
rather than collaboration. Yeah, it is competition. We even even within ASEAN, uh, the hub is a competition with Singapore uh, and now with Thailand and with other countries in ASEAN. Yeah, and secondly is in this policy, private and public higher education institution are allowed to recruit uh, international students. Yeah, because internationalization policy in 1921 is about international student requirement uh, recruitment based on uh, non-monetary aspect, uh, regional uh, understanding, awareness, but later it moves into the non-monetary aspect of internationalization because of neoliberalism, neo neoliberalism approach to higher education. is income generating uh, revenue creation in the context of the country, and the context of institution. Yeah? Next, please. <clears throat> then we have um, specific to soft power, uh, we have the National Higher Education Strategic Plan 2, which is basically uh, to, attract to attract international students to Malaysia based on government to government or based to um, various programs that attract international students to Malaysia, not for the purpose of revenue generation. It's about understanding between countries. It's about understanding between regions that share common interests in this inter internationalization uh, arena. Uh, but at the end, uh, the strategic plan too is about trying to balance the monetary and the non-monetary aspect of internationalization of higher education, which is not always easy. It is balancing act is tough uh, for many to undertake, especially among private higher education institutions, because revenue and income is very important for the survival. Next. And then uh, finally, we have the National Education Blueprint 2015-2025, which is about higher education. So this is uh, an ambitious and a plan geared toward, towards the delivery, delivering a very comprehensive and very up-to-date, uh, forward-looking transformation of the Malaysian higher education system. But apparently, this blueprint, because of COVID, there are issues uh, that emerge, um, giving rise to a question on the current relevancy of uh, this plan uh, in the pandemic era. So this, this is a, 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 an emerging discussion now. It is a issue that needs to be uh, discussed in detail because of uh, COVID-19, yeah? But the blueprint is still there. Now, if we look at the outcome, the minister has the key performance indicators uh, to satisfy. So the minister of performance in 20 in uh, 2015, 2016, 2017, until the 2019 is increased in the number of international students. Very successful, very successful. If the president was asking Jana, just now, what are the factors? Yes, the main factors is ministers was given the KPI to improve the number, to, or to increase the number of international students uh, in Malaysia. So the minister has that objective, yeah, to achieve. So it was, uh, achieved uh, by March 2013, 2019, in terms of numbers, yeah? So ministers was given the responsibility for this, not only the universities. And then the ministers' KPI were then cascaded to the ministry, ministry cascaded to, in, uh, to the university, and so on and so forth. Next. So by June 2019, we'll see the successes of uh, our international education hub, yeah? We have so many universities, we have so many private universities, and we have international, at least 10 international branch campuses of um, in, uh, foreign universities. And the student enrollment, international student enrollment has, uh, has increased to 170,000, 71,000, yeah, in total in all the higher education system in Malaysia, including mobility students. Mobility students are students who don't go for degree, but they are on exchange program. That was the success by June 2019, before the pandemic. Yeah, before the pandemic. Next, please. So by October 2019, the, the trend is still going up. 
Yeah, Malaysia hosted 136 only. Um, there is already uh, some indicator indicator of a decline, not because of COVID, but because of other issues. Yeah, which we can discuss later in the context of Malaysian higher education. For example. Other countries began to develop their own higher education system, so don't, they don't need to send uh, their students to Malaysia. Yeah, there is a competitor and uh, agreement in the context of the Malaysian higher education development in October 2019 that have seen a reduction in the number of international students. Yeah, next. So then come the disruption. Yeah, prior to COVID-19, there were already signs. That Malaysia are not Malaysia is not at was not attract was not attracting international students in from the traditional market because the traditional market had developed their own higher education system. So uh, we are receiving less from Iran, receiving less from uh, India, and so on and so forth. Yeah, and then COVID nineteen came in and the constraint to physical mobility, borders closure. So that is another disruption result in a reduction in numbers. So by December 2020, with pandemic, we have only 93,000 93, international students in our system, which is by December 2020, the figure has a stark contrast to the figure we have in 2019. So there is a marked a decline in international student numbers because of the disruption. So disruption is a issue. So what is the Iranian connection in this? Malaysia and Iran to enhance education ties. That was reported in 2017. Yeah, there is a government to government discussion, engagement, uh, agreement uh, for that kind of education and education ties. Yeah, uh, it was stated that, that we should work together to enhance cooperation in the education sector by introducing various programs. So, in one of the university in Malaysia, they even offer the Persian language in order to. Um, to follow through this um, collaboration agreement between Malaysia and Iran. Yeah? And the government to government in promoting and facilitating flows are critically impo uh, important in the Iranian and Malaysian context. Next. In 2017, we have 4,000 Iranian students pursuing various levels of studies in Malaysian universities. And the, the, as I said earlier, some people offer Persian language course at UPM, University Putra, Malaysia. Uh, in, I think in Malaysia, this is one of public universities which has the largest concentration of uh, students from Iran. Yeah? In between 2015 to 2017, Iran uh, secured the top spot uh, in terms of uh, international students that's coming to Malaysia. By 2019, they has gone down to the 15th spot in our system. Yeah? So uh, we realized that uh, if you look, if you compare with the business sector, the business sector can adjust very well. Yeah, the Iranian business sector, they invested in Malaysia, they can adjust well to bad and good governance uh, in their business dealing. But for students, they may they may not have a, the, a complete informa information on what's going on in Malaysia for them to decide. Yeah, they don't understand, they don't read well the underlying trend. Yeah. Uh, in Malaysia. So there is that difficulty. When we have problem in Malaysia, then the problem has to be felt by the student that's planning to come to Malaysia, uh, which they may have not foreseen those, those uh, problems earlier on. Next, please. So what are the pathways to recovery issues? Uh, while international student has been considered as cash cow for Malaysia, uh, it is no more there. It has become a, a catch. Yeah? Uh, we are not getting um, more income revenue for institution for the country through international students because the numbers has gone down due to pandemic, yeah? the global uh, the border closure. Secondly, uh, global competition, uh, even in the pre-COVID pre, uh, pre area. Yeah? Many of our traditional market have now begun become education hub themselves, for example, Iran. Yeah? Iran is, uh, is becoming an uh, education hub in itself for the Central Asia. Um, Thailand is coming up with its education hub. Indonesia is also coming up with its own education hub. So there's so many education hub coming up uh, in the context of the region. That is a global competition for international students. So those are the main, uh, another issue. 
Openness to mobility. In the past, we are very open. Once you get a right credential, you have no problem in terms of security. You can study in Malaysia. No problem immigration, no problem with home affairs. But now things are changing. There is no more openness. There's always the, this border restriction. Um, openness to mobility is not something that we can take for granted anymore because of COVID, because of other geopolitical issues. Yeah? And fourthly, in the past, we're talking about non-monetary, global, uh, global uh, citizenship, and so on and so forth. But now, because times are difficult, many institutions will look at internationalization of education as a main income-generating component of their activities. So internationalization needs to bring money. So that is another issue. Next, please. So uh, in the context of institution, there is always this balance. How do you recruit student, international student, with ethics in mind? You don't just recruit student for the money. You must recruit student with certain principles and guidelines so that while they bring money, there's always some academic consideration that needs to be hold. So, uh, it's, a, it's a balance between money and the quality of recruitment of students that comes to Malaysia. And that's very tricky. There's always that one side is heavier than the other. Next, please. Question in relation to the Malaysia-Iran context. Yeah? From the perspective of higher education researchers in Iran, uh, we can work together on looking at what lesson learned from Malaysia's pathway to internationalization. A question that was raised by uh, uh, the president earlier on, uh, what success that we have, that we can share with uh, Iran. Is it a win-win situation in the context of Malaysia-Iran global citizenship agenda? Or is it benefiting Malaysia only and not Iran? Is it a win-win? That's another question. Have Malaysia positioned its soft power in higher education, in, in higher education diplomacy well in the context of changing situation of higher education in both Iran and Malaysia? Uh, are we attracting students from Iran? Not, uh, not because of um, how the institution uh, promote higher education, but because uh, there is some geopolitics, there is something that we can uh, mutually benefit, not about money, but in terms of uh, regional uh, understanding, in terms of understanding between countries and so forth. That's diplomacy. That's uh, soft power yeah, or mutual power. Mutual understanding, mutual interest. And fourth, uh, is it Malaysia, uh, because of neoliberal approach to education, think only about money and nothing else? Are they only uh, talking about income generating for institution and not about uh, how the student uh, fare in their higher education system? Uh, uh, there's nothing. Because government funding has, has been reduced, so many higher education institutions, including the private higher education institution, need to look for revenue in order to cover the shortfall in government funding. Is this a good model for Iran higher education system? Next, please. And from the perspective of Iranian students who have studied in Malaysia, what's the balance in terms of monetary and non-monetary aspect of Malaysia's higher education policy and practice? Is it good? Is it bad? Uh, is it a right balance or is it more about money and not more about regional understanding and regional uh, uh, global citizenship, yeah? Secondly, what is understa understandable that while it is understandable that private higher education institutions are more concerned about money, more concerned about income generating and their research seeking behavior, is this proper, appropriate for public higher education institutions to follow? We understand private has to, has to balance the book. They need the revenue. They need to make some uh, profit. Is it okay? Is it appropriate for public higher education to follow the same pathway? Uh, does public institution need to make money? Do they need to make uh, revenue to uh, generate revenue? Uh, is it a good choice? So the student need to to understand uh, where they're going. Yeah. And thirdly, do you think you have contributed to Malaysia? So the student that comes to Malaysia are they part and parcel of the internationalization at home initiative? Are they benefiting? Uh, from that engagement, or are the Malaysian students benefiting from their presence in the Malaysian University campus? Yeah. If yes, in what ways? And if no, 
Why so? So these are um, impertinent questions when we look at internationalization of higher education between Malaysia and Iran, and Iran and Malaysia, vice versa. Next, please. So pathways to recovery, uh, while we're looking at recalibration of what internationalization, why we internationalize, where and how are we internationalize, there is a question of because of the pandemic, we need to have a new higher education trajectory. We cannot depend on the old higher education trajectory, especially in relation to international students. Yeah, we cannot. We need. We need. We cannot depend on past experience. We need to have a new set. We have to have a new clean break and then chart a new trajectory on how we attract international students to Malaysia. Ah, uh, and then there are role and function of the Ministry of Home Affairs, the Immigration Department to contribute to the new agenda, the Ministry of Higher Education itself, and the Education Malaysia Global Services, which, which, uh, which um, um, handle international students coming to Malaysia. They need to play, a, play, a play an important role there. The institution themselves and the individual, individual researcher. How can we uh, look at the evidence and then suggest policy remedial? Next, please. So uh, this, I think this is my slide, probably the last slide. So in order to move forward, yeah, this is what I suggested. I suggest in terms of how we should collaborate, uh, a framework that we need to collaborate. Yes, learning from each other, uh, internationalization, internationalization is about competition. We should change that. Internationalization should be about cooperation. Yeah, uh, We should not perceive things based on perception. We should not decide on things based on perception. We must base ourselves on evidence. What are the evidence based? So the, it must be evidence-based policy making. Okay. And thirdly, there must be some harmony of what we mean by internationalization between Iran and Malaysia. When you talk about internationalization of higher education between Malaysia and Iran, we are talking about the same thing. We are talking about the same element and component so that there will be no misunderstanding. So there must be some harmonization at what we refer to. Next, please. So in conclusion, past success, yes, good, but it's no more reliable. It's no more acceptable. We need rethinking. Disruption, open up possibilities. Yes, that's true. Yeah, it is not always bad. Disruption can bring a few positive things to look forward to. Past formula need not be necessarily uh, true, applicable in the future. Uh, we need recalibration. We need to rethink that. Pathways to recovery, it's a long and winding road. There's no shortcut to this. If we have a shortcut, that's good. But obviously, it's a, going to be a long and winding road ahead. Third, fourth, um, the importance of government to government. Uh, there must be an understanding between the Malaysian government and the Iranian government of what internationalization meant to both our country. If we don't, if we can't agree on that, we can move forward in terms of collaboration, in terms of cooperation, and so on and so forth, in order to facilitate mobility flows. Uh, but while we have got all the other points above, right, there's another item that's beyond us. In higher education in Malaysia, for example, we have to abide to the Ministry of Home Affairs. We have to abide to the rules of the immigration that's beyond us. And now with pandemic, there's another element we have to abide to the rules of the Ministry of Health. So higher education is only one uh, element of the whole puzzle. Yeah, In the past, it's just between higher education and the Ministry of Home Affairs. Now we have the Ministry of, uh, Ministry of Health coming in in the, the whole uh, equation. Next, please. So thank you very much for your time and patience to listen to me. Um, so probably later we can... Uh, talk a little bit deeper on what uh, issues there of interest. So thank you very much, moderator. Over to you. Uh, thank you. Thank you a lot, uh, Dato Moshidi. Thank you for your uh, complete, deep and in detail elaboration of uh, Malaysia's internationalization of higher education from past to present to future from different perspectives with the very rich questions. And uh, it was perfect. Thank you. Uh, 
for you and your uh, precious uh, speech. In the next, uh, excuse me for notice, I like to, I wanted to, uh, I, I forget to say that uh, all participants who, ha uh, who has uh, uh, questions regarding the title and the speeches, you can write down your uh, questions on the chat list um, in Persian or English, no difference. We can translate it. Uh, it uh, if you have any questions, uh, thank you. For the next uh, participant, we go to Mr. Uh, Dr. Sayed Ismail Musavi. Uh, he is an assistant professor at the Institute for Research and Planning in Higher Education. Prior to this, he has been a postdoc researcher at Chalmers University of Technology in Sweden. He performed his PhD studies at the VU University of Amsterdam, the Netherlands. His research has been focused on technology and innovation policy and sustainability uh, transition studies. Currently, he is doing research on uh, politics of higher education particularly in research policies. Uh, right now, I want to ask uh, Dr. Musevi, and I uh, uh, pass uh, the podium to you. Please, Mr. Dr. Musevi. Uh, I can hear you. Uh, please, uh, Dr. Musavi. Please, uh, Dr. Uh, Musavi, I think you are muted. Sorry for interruption. Very sorry for uh, unexpected interruptions. We are in a technical forum, we are working on the issue, and very soon, uh, inshallah, we have Dr. Musavi uh, to deliver his uh, speech. Uh, regarding the uh, previous speech, precious speech by Dr. Uh, by uh, Dr. Daute Moshidi, uh, very different topics, very different uh, points um, raised, uh, especially regarding the harmonization. Uh, yes, uh, okay. do, you, do you hear yes, me? Yes, perfect, perfect, doctor. Yeah, hello, uh, hello, uh, everybody. Bismillah uh, ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. First of all, uh, thank you for both parties to arrange uh, this meeting. And I should uh, appreciate uh, the great presentation of uh, Dr. Nushahi and Professor Sirat for his uh, very useful uh, explanation of the current situation of uh, internationalization in Malaysia. Thank you so much for your kind presentation. Um, this uh, presentation that I'm going to present, this slide, um, has been prepared in, um, in collaboration with uh, my dear colleagues, Dr. Uh, Zakar Salehi and Dr. Uh, Puatashi. Uh, thank you bo to both of them. Uh, but uh, it, it was decided that, I'm, uh, that I present this slide uh, for today's um, meeting. So the, we are going to talk about Iran's internationalization of the higher education, um, mainly on processes, uh, challenges, and strategies that now uh, we in Iran have uh, to uh, facilitate, uh, you hear me? It's 
it's okay, Professor? Yeah, do you hear me now? Do you have voice? Yes. I, yeah, thanks. So, um, as I said, we are going to talk about uh, Iran's internationalization, processes, challenges, and strategy. Please go next. Yeah. As you know, the, as also the Professor Sirat has mentioned, that uh, internationalization is not a new term and uh, has been used uh, mainly in political uh, science and governmental relations. Um, and uh, from since 1980s, uh, has been uh, uh, been raised in the education, higher education, as a new terms and concept to uh, to uh, discuss and to to work on it. So um, a specific uh, definition that maybe we could uh, have from night that uh, internationalization at the national sector and institutional levels. Uh, can be defined as the process of integrating an international, uh, intercultural, or global dimension into the purpose, functions, and uh, or delivery of the uh, higher education. Uh, so, uh, based on this uh, definition, please go next. Uh, there are uh, different reasons uh, for different countries uh, for moving uh, towards the internationalization, as he, as we heard from the Professor Surat that uh, he mentioned about the uh, different um, rationales of uh, neoliberalism, self uh, uh, diplomacy, self power, or uh, other uh, categories. Uh, but um, I would like to uh, add to these uh, rationales that, uh, as you know, there are several reasons uh, for moving toward the internationalization, including uh, human resource development, strategic partnership, uh, income generation in line with the neoliberalism or marketing approach to higher education or uh, cultural um, exchange. So there are different um, uh, reasons uh, and we can categorize them to political, economic, social, cultural and uh, scientific reasons. Uh, if you, if uh, um, you know that uh, there are different categories of uh, and indicators of uh, for uh, uh, um, measuring or showing the internationalization of the higher education, but uh, one of the most important, as you know, is the number of international students uh, uh, that can be considered as one of the most important indicator of uh, internationalization in different countries, and. Um, if you consider this indicator as an important indicator of internationalization, we see that uh, for 30 years after the Islamic Revolution uh, in Iran, uh, the dominant approach uh, uh, for international uh, scientific cooperation in Iran has been a uh, cultural one. So the main uh, um, uh, enabler of uh, internationalization so for Iran has been um, um, international students and uh, research collaboration. And uh, the main target countries have been neighboring countries and Muslim nations that we have a cultural and historical uh, communities with them. Sorry. Uh, so, uh, for example, we see that uh, we had a... Um, um, students uh, from uh, Afghanistan, from uh, Turkish, from Bosnia at the early um, uh, years of the, uh, after the revolution as a, a international students in Iran. Please go the next. So here, um, um, there is a process of internationalization uh, of uh, shifting uh, the uh, and the process of the internationalization in Iran is, is a bit uh, we can define in two categories um, in the early years of the uh, uh, after the revolution that is mainly is very interlinked to the uh, uh, domestic uh, needs of the higher education in Iran. Uh, um, since the early years of the Islamic revolution, there has been an attempt to expand and increase the capacity of higher education uh, 
specifically in mid uh, 2000, uh, 2000, uh, 2000 uh, as the generation born of the, in the mid 1980, we had a huge population. They need uh, they reached the level that they need uh, the higher education. They demanded higher education. So the, the government uh, forced to establish new government uh, universities and developed. Uh, Sorry, uh, private universities uh, to meet uh, this uh, green demand for higher education. So, if we see that um, the statistics uh, in 2000, uh, we had almost uh, 52 university government university, but in 2012 we had uh, almost 80. In line with this, uh, to meet these demands, also we had uh, private uh, universities. Also, we had uh, uh, one public university as an uh, Islamic Azad uh, university, uh, that is a tuition-based uh, uh, fee university. That uh, in uh, um, they have, this university has a lot of branches in different cities. Doesn't matter a small and uh, big cities. They had a lot of branches, and also we had uh, another um, governmental university that is a. Uh, Payonur University that is particularly focused on uh, distance learning to meet these uh, needs, these demands. So uh, in line with this, uh, in to line to meet these demands, um, also we had, a, uh, we had an increase of the international students because we have increased the capacity. So also we have uh, increased the capacity for international students. Uh, so in, the, for example, uh, uh, as I said, uh, uh, please go to the next. Yeah, in 2000, uh, uh, in year 2000, academic year of 1999-2000, uh, we had uh, uh, about uh, 1,000 1, international students. Uh, that's mainly from Afghanistan, as I said. Uh, but uh, in 2014, we had uh, about uh, 14,000 14, international students from 92 countries. And uh, this uh, increase also in the next years, uh, in the following years to 21,000. So as you can see, when we could uh, have managed and handled the, um, the needs and demands uh, for domestic uh, students, also in line with these demands, also we could increase the uh, international, uh, uh, the number of international students. Uh, so, um, uh, please go to the next. So, this is a, 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 a very a number of foreign students based on the academic year, as you can see uh, from 2009 to 2019. We had, uh, for example, we had uh, uh, about uh, 3,000 uh, in 2009, and we reached to the level of uh, 21,000. So from 2014, that we could manage the, the domestic demands, you can see a significant uh, increase of the uh, students, uh, of the foreign students in Iranian universities. Please go to the next. Yeah, that is the same uh, um, uh, about the, the, the number of students by degrees. As you can see, the main, uh, until uh, 2018, the main uh, uh, capacity, the main number of us uh, the students uh, for uh, they studied at the bachelor level, um, and then we had a master and a PhDs. Uh, so go to next, please. And regarding the number of uh, uh, students uh, by gender, uh, as you can see, uh, we had a bit uh, higher percentage of male students in Iranian uh, universities, uh, foreign international students. But uh, you can see this trend has been uh, kept uh, in different years, and we have uh, we see a bit uh, higher percentage of the male students compared to female students in Iranian universities uh, of the international students. Please go next. Yeah, as I said, we had a, a cultural uh, uh, approach mainly, uh, mainly after the revolution, and you can see that we had a, we have a students we had a student from Afghanistan, yeah, uh, about fourteen thousand, and the next one was Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, uh, and uh, if you see this in countries, you can see that uh, 
these countries are mainly our Muslim countries, our neighbors' country, and also cultural and uh, uh, politically they are in line with your, our uh, interest. So that is that has because of this, we would say that has been mainly cultural one as an approach to have a, a internationalization. Uh, please go to next. Yeah, but uh, from 2014, we uh, almost we see a shift in approach to internationalization, and uh, the Iranian universities and also uh, Ministry of Science, Research, and Technology, in line also the Ministry of uh, Medi Health and Medical Sciences, they try to shift this approach to a. Uh, the cultural political model to a combination of scientific education model and economic model. Um, uh, so uh, here we see that now uh, they shifted to a, um, um, uh, to see from a marketing perspective to this uh, uh, business uh, to in higher education as a type of the business. And we try to, in addition to seeing as a business, we also would like to increase our scientific and educational uh, collaboration with uh, uh, other countries. Uh, please go next. Yeah, so in 2009, 2021, 2020, uh, we see that about uh, um, 57,000 students, uh, foreign students, they study in Iran. So we see a very uh, significant uh, um, uh, increase of the foreign students in Iran. Uh, so please go next. And um, uh, based on the uh, 20 years national vision of the documents that has been, uh, should be end in 2025, we uh, expect that 1.8% uh, of the uh, total student population uh, should be uh, foreign students, international students, and uh, almost should be 75,000 uh, uh, at the end of the program. Please go to the next. So um, some measures uh, have been uh, made, um, uh, adopted or taken to uh, at the national level to facilitate uh, this process. Uh, for example, the uh, MSRT or Ministry of Science, Research and Technology in collaboration with the universities, they formed uh, 17 national working groups. That's uh, in, uh, in each working group we have a, a, a um, uh, main university as the coordinator of the, that specific country and also other uh, universities they can join to this working group uh, and they have a, they work on how they can handle and, uh, and facilitate the collaboration with uh, um, other universities of that country uh, in these uh, working groups now we see that we have mainly focus on uh, China, Russia and European countries and um, uh, so we see a shift, as I said, we see a shift as a as a, as an indicator of the shift of the uh, approach to uh, internationalization. And uh, for example, in, also we, we we can talk about the internationalization in, at abroad. In abroad, for example, uh, Iran is one of the best, uh, unfortunately, or we could say fortunately, because we should see. From which perspective we can see this uh, issue that uh, Iran sends um, a lot of students uh, to foreign countries, uh, mainly uh, the targeted countries are United States, uh, United Kingdom, Germany, uh, uh, Australia, uh, uh, and uh, uh, also uh, Malaysia, India, as uh, Professor Sirat mentioned, uh, we had a large number of uh, students in Malaysia also. So uh, that is also another uh, aspect of internationalization in Iran, uh, but also providing a short-term and long-term uh, scholarship to non-Iranian students in different fields, specifically for patient language, uh, Islamic studies, uh, literature uh, to, for students, or uh, establishing the Persian language chairs in foreign universities, uh, and facilitating the regulation uh, uh, regarding the uh, establishment and supporting uh, 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 Islamic studies uh, chairs in different uh, uh, universities in, the com in different countries, uh, providing a guideline on how to uh, um, 
develop and uh, uh, conclude the international agreement with foreign universities. Of course, the universities are autonomous, but uh, they try to uh, uh, give a direction to this and facilitate uh, this uh, uh, process. Uh, and also, uh, the, there is a, uh, uh, some uh, approval of that uh, how the universities they can uh, employ um, uh, faculty members uh, from foreign countries. And now, uh, in the last uh, eight years, we had uh, almost 2,000 uh, uh, foreign professor uh, in Iran uh, for as a researcher as a. Um, teaching a staff or uh, as a um, or uh, holding different workshops in Iranian universities. So, um, uh, unfortunately, because of the COVID, we don't uh, see a lot of delegations these days. But uh, before, uh, there was a lot of uh, delegation from different countries visiting Iranian universities, and also we have a very active uh, partic uh, Iranian university actively participate in international ranking system of universities and also Iranian universities, uh, they have an um, uh, international project, research project with different foreign countries. So these are some measures that I mentioned as in, uh, at the national level to uh, uh, increase and facilitate the internationalization of um, uh, Iranian uh, higher education. Please go next. So, uh, also there are some barriers to this uh, um, uh, internationalization. Uh, one of them, I would say, or maybe if you, for example, uh, Professor Sirad mentioned that even in uh, uh, one of the Malaysian university, they had a, a Persian language course. Uh, so that is, uh, we can see they had uh, this uh, marketing approach and pragmatic approach to uh, internationalization, but uh, uh, in Iran, uh, we see that uh, uh, in, um, just for some exception, we cannot, uh, there is no English language programs in universities, just very in some ex excep exception, some university, very limited university, uh, they have it. So that is a main barrier of the absorbing foreign students. They should come to Iran, they should uh, uh, learn the uh, Farsi language first. And also, this is a pre-requirement for their graduation that they should know the Persian language. So that is one of the main barriers that uh, should be considered. Um, also, uh, we have uh, some uh, um, uh, issues that is uh, out of our hand, specifically uh, economic sanctions against Iran by the United States. That is uh, has raised problems uh, for. Um, uh, uh, banking uh, uh, money exchange, so that is also should be, uh, we should think about that. Uh, also, um, uh, of course, uh, also Professor Sirad mentioned about the disruption in Malaysia uh, due to COVID-19. Also, that is something now we have uh, in Iran also, the same problem. And um, the other issue is about the lack of uh, in infrastructure for foreign students regarding because um, we need to uh, in improve this infrastructure. And uh, another issue that also that is in line with the, uh, the uh, uh, presentation of the uh, Professor Sirat is about the immigration policies that also you mentioned that uh, in Iran also we have a, a problem uh, inappropriate immigration policy. For example, I see that um, uh, university student when they uh, graduated, for example, in two weeks they should leave the country, leave the country. But uh, in um, uh, uh, European countries, for example, I see that if you graduated, you have um, one year uh, as, a, as a, you you still you can extend your visa to get a, a job in that country. Uh, so that is something that also we should learn from uh, those countries for uh, regarding the immigration policies. And also another issue that also is, is somehow in line with the Professor Sirot uh, that he's also he mentioned about the uh, policy making agencies that uh, she, he mentioned about the uh, Ministry of Health. But also in addition to Ministry of Health, we should say we have different uh, agencies uh, of, uh, the, they are involved in policy making for internationalization that is uh, should be uh, handled of course there are some measures to handle this but uh, there is a, a space still to work on it please go ahead 
Um, acting a strategy. There are some um, uh, initiatives to handle these uh, challenges uh, in line with internationalization at home as an approach of internationalization, internationalization in Iran. One of them, uh, as I mentioned, we have now a good quantity of the universities. Now is the time to improve the quality of education. Of course, uh, we have a good uh, quality now uh, still, but we should improve it uh, and uh, increase that uh, quality. Uh, regarding, uh, we should increase our exchange program and joint teaching uh, uh, program specifically maybe because of the COVID-19 we should uh, use the virtual platform but also there is a, a regulation barrier here that uh, for example in Iran um, the, there is a bit differences between the virtual uh, education or distance education and uh, um, uh, uh, traditional education that should be I don't know maybe uh, we should think about this that they should have the same uh, validity for the employers. Uh, encouraging professors and researchers to participate more in international research. There are some programs that we, are have, we have now. Uh, and also, um, as I mentioned, uh, creating a single portal, a window for all the students that they have a single portal and single window for uh, application procedures. I will explain more about this and also internationalization of the curriculum of the universities. For example, if, you, if we have a um, curriculum that is aligned with the curriculum of the well-known universities in the world, then for example, if we have a student here at Malaysia or Iran, uh, they got uh, graduated from master and they want to go to uh, that universities, then it's easier for them to convince the, uh, that university, okay, I am, qualified for this higher level of the education. So go uh, next, please. So, um, yeah, we are on the sanctions, but also we see that uh, based on the uh, Iranian uh, uh, president of uh, Tehran University that uh, he mentioned that science has no borders. So uh, we think, uh, as uh, Professor Sivatoza mentioned, uh, uh, science diplomacy and academic diplomacy uh, is uh, one of our tools to facilitate uh, this uh, process and we should uh, um, mainly focus on these uh, instruments to uh, in-house our uh, collaboration, uh, specifically in our case between Malaysia and uh, Iran. Please go next. Okay, and uh, as I mentioned, there are, uh, we have uh, now in Iran, there is a, a single portal, single window for application procedure, that is uh, Education Iran, and that's uh, a student, they can go there and uh, apply uh, for different universities. Um, why a study in Iran? They explain why you should study in Iran. Of course, in addition to some experience of your foreign students, they provide some reason that why you should study Iran. For example, one of them is that uh, in in last 10 years, uh, uh, Iranian university has been ranked uh, uh, on the top uh, as a for scientific growth. For example, in 2019, Iran ranked uh, second worldwide for scientific growth. So that is, uh, uh, for example, one example and the quality of higher education, uh, you know that's, um, uh, some Iranian universities, they are brand universities, and uh, their students, they can directly get admission from, uh, for example, United States, from bachelor to PhD level, uh, for uh, specifically for engineering uh, students, uh, for example, from uh, Sharif University of Technology or Amir Kabe University of Technology uh, or University of Tehran. Uh, or also, for example, I uh, heard from a, um, uh, a student that uh, she mentioned, I wanted to go to United States uh, for medical education, but when I compared the, um, the fees, the tuition fees, and also the ranking of the universities, I noticed that uh, uh, medical university of Tehran has a, a higher ranking in compared to uh, some of the uh, American universities. So I decided to um, uh, continue my studies in Iran. So there are uh, different reasons, for example, cultural issue, religious issue, or, uh, also the uh, 
um, uh, 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 very uh, ancient, in the culture and civilization of Iran, for example, we could say the uh, hospitality of Iranians. So uh, we don't uh, we don't want to talk about these issues. But there are different reasons that why um, uh, Iran is an interesting uh, destination for uh, foreign students, and uh, specifically we welcome uh, Malaysian students. Uh, um, as a uh, Muslim country is, is mainly to come to Iran and uh, uh, we can uh, work on it. Of course, we also have a lot of uh, Iranian students there. So that is a platform for further collaboration between us and Malaysia. Uh, thanks again for your, please go to next. Thank you so much for your kind uh, attention and look forward to hearing uh, uh, to any question. Thanks so much. Uh, thank you, thank you for both, uh, for uh, both of you and Miss uh, Dr. Nushahi for your precious uh, speeches. Uh, Dr. Musavi also in details uh, cover a wide range of issues and topics regarding the internationalization of higher education in Iran, from statistics to perspectives, challenges, and um, possible future which have ahead. Uh, right now, I want to ask the uh, participants who um, have uh, questions regarding the topic and uh, other uh, issues that uh, raise up here. Uh, we have three uh, questions in the chat list by uh, members. I don't know who is Miss or uh, Mr. Ash, uh, Ash, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Ms. Asghari, Ms. Asghari, Dr. Asghari, and uh, Dr. Forsad Kar and uh, Dr. Muhammad Islahi. Uh, I don't know which one of the lecturers can uh, and would like to answer these questions. Uh, first is a comment by Dr. Asghari that uh, said uh, one way to increase international cooperation between Iran and Malaysia is by awarding scholarships to students. Iranian students study in Malaysia at their own expense. Malaysia universities are expect, expected to provide funding for Iranian students through scholarship. I think uh, this is, uh, should go to um, Dato Morshidi. All right, thank you very much, uh, moderator, uh, Dr. Fatih, uh, thank you. for highlighting the questions. Uh, yes, indeed, um, in the context of the Commonwealth, yeah, um, the Commonwealth countries, we have the Malaysian Technical uh, Cooperation Program that allows um, um, student, selected students from Commonwealth countries, developing Commonwealth countries, coming to Malaysia to study under uh, that kind of scholarship. So that's a mutual exchange kind of thing. Uh, but um, within Iran, Malaysia and Iran, we have not uh, developed that kind of close relationship. Uh, probably if we can develop something on the same basis uh, in the context of the um, organization of Islamic uh, uh, conference countries, um, On, uh, trying to get a webcam on. Okay. Um, well, as I was saying just now, in the context of Commonwealth countries, we have that kind of, um, um, what do you call it, um, arrangement uh, between countries, yeah? Between Malaysia and another Commonwealth countries. They come to Malaysia on a, on a Commonwealth scholarship or funded by the Malaysian government, but for the, for the for the in the context of Malaysia and Iran, we have not developed that kind of arrangement, which is um, very um, important uh, to have those kind of arrangement in order to develop that kind of relationship, positive relationship. Yeah, and uh, based on uh, OIC, for example, or Organization of Islamic Conference Countries. Uh, or any other um, collaborative uh, arrangement between Malaysia and Iran. 
Um, to me, as I understand, I've been in the ministry before, between 2011 and 2014. Uh, there were uh, delegation from Iran coming to the Ministry of Education Malaysia to discuss collaborative arrangement. Um, and so far, we, we have not um, uh, materialized that kind of uh, arrangement. Yeah, We keep on talking, talking, talking. Uh, it's always NATO. Yeah? Uh, no action, talk only. Uh, we have not had the CONEP program, program in place. Yeah? Uh, but I was informed um, at the ministry level uh, they have already um, uh, drafted uh, recently um, um, uh, MOU for the consideration of the Iranian government in order to develop that Iran-Malaysia relationship. Uh, but as always the case, uh, they always have that draft thing, the discussion, the draft element, the draft, but where is the actual uh, uh, understanding, the actual, actual agreement between Malaysia and Iran? So unless and until, uh, that's why I say the government-to-government -government arrangement is very important uh, for, the, for us to move forward. Without government-to-government -government arrangement, it is very difficult uh, for Malaysia to provide scholarship and Iranian students come here and vice versa. Uh, that has to be taken up by the government. That's why in my last slide, I insisted on the government-to-government -government arrangement prior to university-to-university -to -university arrangement. Yeah. Uh, we cannot move far between the universities if we don't have the government-to-government -government arrangement, yeah? especially in the context of public universities. Yeah? In private universities, a different story. Uh, you can have an arrangement between a private university in Malaysia and private university in Iran, no problem. But when it comes to public universities, it has to be government-to-government -government kind of uh, setup. Yeah? That is my response to the first question, there is always a reciprocal arrangement between the two countries. Otherwise, uh, nothing much we can offer it. Uh, it's always talking and no, no positive and concrete action coming up from that discussion. Thank you very much for the first question. Over to you, moderator. Uh, thank you, uh, Dato Moshidi. Thank you very much. I return to the first question which raised by uh, Mr. Tenu Shahi about the uh, Malaysia successful story on internationalization of higher education. Uh, and what do you, uh, I uh, again ask the question, what do you think for uh, possible areas for cooperation and for uh, participation, collaboration, and internationalization of higher education between Iran and Malaysia regarding a very important phenomena, which we call it harmonization. Because when I look at the statistics in harmonization program of Malaysia, Iran, Iran has a very low uh, status. And uh, I can see in the 10 first countries regarding the harmonization. I'd like you to more elaborate on the question and uh, harmonization and possible perspectives. Is that for me? Yes, or yes, or Dr. Moshi. I, uh... Okay. All right. Um, um, you know, anything between Malaysia and Iran, uh, unlike between Malaysia and Vietnam, Malaysia and Thailand, Malaysia and uh, Indonesia. Uh, when it comes to Malaysia and Iran, it always has to be based on government arrangement. Um, you know, any initiative, it has to get uh, some basic framework that's been agreed uh, between the two governments. Yeah? Um, uh, we, are, we are in context of the different geopolitics uh, uh, scenarios, yeah, between Iran and Malaysia compared to between Malaysia and other ASEAN countries, yeah. So there's a lot of uh, academic collaborative arrangement uh, we can explore um, with, uh, especially in the context of public universities, uh, especially uh, um, public universities, yeah, a lot of um, items, a lot of program initiative we can pursue uh, in the context of that kind of government-to-government -government arrangement. Yeah? Uh, that's why, uh, to me, unless and until we have that kind of framework, um, it is very difficult to move forward. 
it's okay between RIPHE and IPTN to do some research, to do some academic research and things and, and so forth. At that level, uh, individual research, group research, between institutions um, is, is possible. But when we want to go higher, uh, for example, providing scholarship, uh, inviting um, academics to Malaysia or Malaysia to Iran, uh, there'll be another level. Yeah, there'll be another level that we need to be that we need to sort out uh, between government to government arrangement. Yeah, uh, different from if Malaysian academic going to Singapore or Malaysian academic going to Thailand or Thailand academic going to Malaysia. It's a different level. So um, to to me, uh, unless and until uh, our government have arrived at certain arrangement, uh, large scale research which involve the transfer of resources which involve um, uh, exchange of uh, academics large scale ex uh, academic and student uh, it is going to be uh, very tough but mind you uh, malaysian success in the past is because they have been able to explore something uh, new in the, in the system for example if you look at our education system uh, there are many things that Malaysians started at first, like dual, um, uh, four plus one, three plus two kind of academic arrangement between universities in the West. Uh, and they came to Malaysia, transnational, inter, uh, cross-border higher education between Western countries and Malaysia. Uh, we have developed it uh, in that sense. Yeah. So there are a few things that we have developed. We have peer, pioneer, we were pioneering in that sense. So uh, in the past, we have been successful because we have been able to think uh, in that way. Uh, but now it is quite uh, constraining because of geopolitics. Yeah, uh, geopolitics, we cannot underestimate uh, the issues of geopolitics uh, between countries. Okay? Am I okay? Can I? Yeah, thank can... you, thank you, thank you for your. Uh, answer and for your insights. Uh, Mr. Mustabi, uh, I have a question regarding the uh, your statistics uh, because when we compare both uh, countries uh, regarding the uh, re receiving foreign students, uh, both countries mainly receive students from their neighboring countries. Uh, but uh, there is a difference uh, between uh, two countries, and it's uh, regarding the uh, quality of uh, students they, they, uh, that uh, go to both uh, countries. I'd like you to, based on the uh, statistics that uh, you present in your presentation, uh, more uh, explain about the uh, quality and challenges that uh, Iranian higher education are facing regarding the uh, students and uh, the countries that we receive these uh, students. Yeah, first of all, uh, thank you to uh, Professor uh, Sirat for uh, his uh, useful explanation. Uh, before going to answer your question, I'm going to uh, uh, um, uh, mentioned that uh, and highlight that uh, regarding the Iranian uh, and uh, Malaysia and the Iran's uh, uh, collaboration, I remember that, I don't know about now, but I remember that in the recent years we had a scientific counselor in uh, Malaysia for uh, boosting uh, collaboration between Iran and uh, in Malaysia and, uh, and regarding the uh, uh, scholarship granting a scholarship to both uh, uh, parties students it should be considered that for example if we send uh, around 10,000 students to Malaysia is not uh, 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 is not wise to ex expect that the Malaysia provides 10,000 uh, um, scholarship to Iranian students or uh, other also the same here because uh, the, we have a limited budget and also mainly the countries, uh, the strategy and policy of the country is that uh, mainly they provide uh, uh, grants or funds to elite uh, uh, part of the students, not to all part of the students. Also, you can see that uh, in Malaysia, they had, a, um, of course, in Iran, we had a less 
before, but maybe we are going to have this more highlighted. But if you can see in Malaysia, they had a, um, uh, uh, a very marketing uh, approach to and uh, see the higher education also as a business, specifically for private universities. So uh, business should work. So it's not very uh, uh, wise to expect to have the scholarship, for example, for 10,000 students for both parties. Uh, that is, um, that maybe, I don't know whether the Malaysia, they, they have a, uh, they has a, a scientific counselor in, in Iran or not. That is something that we should uh, investigate now. Uh, but I think also um, uh, that is uh, another issue, but the most important uh, that maybe is that Iranian and uh, Malaysian uni university, they should uh, start uh, um, uh, collaboration and more. Of course, I know that uh, some Iranian uh, university, for example, I know that for the MBA programs, uh, Sharif University of Technology, they had a collaboration with multimedia universities. Uh, on these uh, specific programs. Um, uh, so that is something that should be continued. Um, uh, the other, uh, in the, um, if I come back to your question, uh, Mr. Fatah, uh, regarding the quality of the students, uh, um, now I cannot uh, tell exactly whether we have absorbed the high quality of student or not. That is something that we should investigate. Uh, but if we compare about the uh, target countries. Okay, for example, if we have a student from uh, Iraq, from Syria, from Afghanistan, um, if we compare the knowledge level of uh, and the scientific progress in this country, yeah, we can see that uh, regarding the quality of the absorbing a student, uh, we haven't absorbed a student from uh, high level scientific countries. Yeah, that's true. But maybe individually we could uh, have a students very you know, with high quality. But I don't know exactly where that. I cannot al also explain uh, regarding this individual level. But regarding the country, yeah, that's true. That's something that because of this now we are going to shift our approach to scientific uh, uh, and educational collaboration. For example, now we have a lot of exchange uh, program with European uh, uh, countries, but of course, uh, mainly we use, for example, Erasmus Plus to sending a student. Also, there is an opportunity for European countries. Also, this is the same for Malaysian and China that we have uh, some uh, programs for exchanging the students. That is something that now we have, uh, I think, in the, both countries. Um, uh, to absorb the higher, higher quality students, and maybe we should ask this question also from Professor Sirat, what they have done. For example, we see a lot of uh, Iranian students, when they go to this uh, Malaysian university, we see that they have a uh, good quality based on their output. For example, we see that uh, um, publications, their publication in the highly reputed journals of the, in the world. So that is uh, an indicator of the, okay, that is a higher quality and that is a high quality students. Of course, also that is in the context of the higher quality of the education in Malaysia. That is also another issue that we should consider. But also that is our question from Professor Surat. Um, um, yeah, that is uh, that's something also maybe we should uh, learn from you. What is your strategy to absorb a higher quality students from different countries, specifically from uh, um, advanced countries? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fat. Okay. Um, can, can I respond? Yes, Where of course. That? Yes, okay. yes, of course. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Before the establishment of the Education Malaysia Global Services, um, all I education institutions that were given the permit or license to recruit international students, they were allowed to do so. Okay. And uh, we have no control about the quality of student they bring in or they brought in to Malaysia. But when I was in the ministry in 2011, 2012, and then 2013, we uh, established in 2012 the Education Malaysia Global Services. Okay? And uh, this agency, which is under the Ministry of Higher Education, uh, we look at the quality of student that 
will be admitted to Malaysian higher education institution. Okay, so the main function of this uh, entity is to make sure that uh, students that are being that are allowed a given permit, a visa to study in Malaysia, are bona fide student and they are student of quality uh, and uh, from other countries. Yeah, so they have a very stringent uh, uh, mechanism to determine they are real student. They come to Malaysia to study and they have the right qualification to study. Before that, before 2011, anybody that come, they apply to Malaysia and the institution accept them, the, the immigration are uh, obliged to. So there's another way to ensure that a uh, uh, quality student comes in to study to, in Malaysia. Okay, uh, there's no such thing as free flow anymore. Okay, there is a system where we vet. Now, in terms of um, how we manage to attract um, uh, students from other developed countries, there's always this engagement, this arrangement uh, in terms of student mobility uh, through international agencies like EU, uh, USAID, or any other agencies. The, the important thing there is the use of the English language. Okay. Uh, it will it will be very difficult to attract this talented student from abroad if they have to learn Bahasa Malaysia at certain level before they are being allowed to enter. Because we use English at the international at the higher level, at postgraduate and even at the undergraduate level for certain courses, that has made it possible for students to come in, especially uh, quality students, to be involved in. Uh, mobility programs, yeah. So there are uh, various um, inst uh, various um, regulations and uh, practices in place, and inter and higher education institution also um, based on the Senate rules and the Ministry of Higher Education regulation. They have they have to have in place certain regulation before they uh, admit student uh, to Malaysia. Uh, to Malaysian institution. So there are various ways to determine quality uh, student in the Malaysian education system, especially international quality student. Yeah, uh, I don't know uh, in the case of Iran whether you have an agency that vet student qualification before they say yes, you can come to Malaysia and use that letter to apply for the visa. Uh, do you have the same agency, equivalent agency in the case of Iran? Um, I don't know exactly this uh, this something that, but I think this is mainly based on the university, host university. I think um, if the host university uh, uh, accept the qualification of the student, then uh, they can uh, be accepted. But the point is that also Iranian university they put a, a very uh, stringent and uh, very um, high standard quality for attracting, for absorbing, uh, accepting the students. Uh, that is uh, something that I'm sure, specifically because, you know, in Iran, uh, we don't, uh, the private university uh, currently, they don't have uh, this permission to uh, accept uh, foreign students, uh, just very uh, well-known universities, government university, they have uh, this permission to uh, accept the students. So those universities, because they have a very high standard uh, quality education and quality, I think if they uh, accept a low quality student, then the student uh, should be failed because that is uh, something that also for, uh, for example, if you consider Sharif University of Technology, uh, if you go there, you can see that uh, the, and the standard uh, for graduation is very high. So these students mainly they are uh, going to continue their study in the United States in good universities. So if if they want to see it in besides the, these students, I think that, that is the university that that can see, they consider this uh, qualification. Uh, but I think we don't have such an agency in Iran that they should uh, consider this. But I'm not sure. We don't have your voice, Professor.
Mr. Professor, you are muted. آی دکتر قاسمی یه بار بیزمت خارج بشین دوباره وارد چیم بیزمت جناب فاطر بیزمت سوالاتی که در باکس اومده رو هم که دونم هم سوال کردن چهش پیش خواهم دکتر ببخشید ببخشید چهش حتما آقای مهندس از اون بر مشکل ایجاد شده آقای مهندس شوقی؟ بله خانم دکتر آقا اینترنتشون شد <laughs> آقای دکتر صدای منو میشنوین؟ Okay. All right, thank you. Let's get back to what I've said earlier. Uh, if you look at the Malaysian system, we have only 20 public universities and we have 400 plus private higher education institutions. So we need that agency. In the case of Iran, you have about 80 public institutions uh, and you said the public institution can handle the quality uh, aspect of students. Uh, so uh, the context would be different, yeah. But uh, why do you, why do you need so many public universities? And there's a big heavy investment for the government. Why so many public universities? Yeah, that is a challenge now these days. You know, that <laughs> it's a challenge. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, uh, uh, Dr. Nushan, can you explain or I, I should explain? No, no, you, you. Yeah, okay, thanks. You. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, that is, uh, as I mentioned, uh, uh, after the revolution, we have just, for example, uh, 52, and then we had a high percentage of the uh, demands, of the new coming demands. So also this is a based on constitution that uh, that is something that uh, Iranian government should uh, provide the capacity for higher education also as well for the Iranian uh, citizens. Uh, that one point that is also uh, Iranian is a cultural issue that Iranian also they see education, specifically higher education as a, a must, as a, something that they should do as a, I don't know, a bit, about social class or about cultural or maybe about they are interested in this uh, uh, type of education. Um, uh, so because of that, we had uh, this uh, higher education, but also the point is that uh, in the previous years, mainly the university have been in the very uh, central, in the very advanced and developed cities. So the, that was the role of the government to expand the, these uh, universities to, to hold the countries. That is also another um, uh, problem and challenge that, that, that forced the government to establish these government uh, uh, um, universities. But these days, as I said, we, this, all these government uh, universities, also they have a, a lack of students in some uh, measures. So that is now a new challenge for the right. MSRT to maybe somehow to um, uh, 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 merge these universities in one university. But again, that is a challenge because also the, some cities, they say, okay, you should keep our university. You shouldn't emerge, merge our university to another one. And it's not just about the scientific or science policy, or it's also about the politics in the country. 
All right, all right. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Very interesting. Yeah. Um, excuse me for uh, a question from Dr. Forsat Kar. Uh, he asked uh, Dr. Moshidi, uh, one preferred way to cope with COVID-19 issues and raising uh, higher education cooperation between Iran and Malaysia at the same time, maybe to establish joint programs with Iranian universities, especially in right. a virtual format such as e-learning. Your yeah. comment, please. Yeah. I think that that is possible in in my other presentations um, to the Malaysian uh, academics. I was proposing uh, in the future uh, to deal with this uh, post-COVID uh, scenario is for Malaysian institution uh, to export education to virtual platforms. Yeah, uh, either on their own, uh, the beam the they, um, uh, or they deliver virtually their programs to other countries uh, when students are in their own countries, or they do that in collaboration with, um, with uh, uh, universities in Iran, for example. Yeah? But the problem with virtual um, delivery of uh, education is it's the not, not the same as uh, Iranian student coming to Malaysia, Malaysian student going to Europe, or European student coming to Singapore. Um, th that's the different, different um, 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 uh, benefit uh, for students in that sense. But in the post-COVID uh, situation where border closure is still a reality or will, be, will continue to be a, a hindrance, then virtual delivery of higher education uh, either uh, on its own from Malaysian institution or in collaboration with um, um, universities in Iran uh, is uh, at all the possibilities. Uh, I don't think it is going to be an issue of geopolitics because there will be no movement of students. Yeah? Uh, there will be uh, no physical movement, but um, there will be uh, a need of good collaboration and working relationship between Malaysian qualification agency and any agency that determine uh, accreditation, qualification, quality of uh, courses in Iran. They have to come up with some standard guidelines, standard practice in order to determine that uh, that joint program is of quality. Um, is that the responsibility of our, uh, IRPHE in terms of uh, qualification accreditation of uh, courses offered by the Iranian universities. In Malaysia, we have the Malaysian Qualification Agency that deal with uh, quality assurance, accreditation, and so on. Uh, is that the role of RIPHE? No, no. In Iran, we no. have a, a, a directory uh, general in the, yeah. in the students' organization efforts. That is uh -huh. the part of the Ministry of Science, Research, and Technology. In that uh -huh. uh, uh, organization, we have a, a general directory as a, a graduation uh, 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 department. So this, uh, the part, this uh, uh, directory, they has the authority and the capacity to accreditate the different universities in different countries. So right. that is the main, uh, yeah, but it's not our uh, duty. But, but the virtual, virtual e-learning, the outcome would be different yeah. from a physical face-to-face uh, -face kind of thing. Yeah. So what is possible, but the outcome of education would be different. Yeah. yeah? Yeah, you know, Professor, also there is a one point because in internationalization, our our main point is not just about the uh, business, it's all about cross-cultural uh, right. collaboration. Right. It's right. also about uh, getting tacit knowledge. You know, sometimes you right. need to go right. to Malaysia University okay. to see uh, their uh, style of teaching, their behavior with the students, their right. uh, organization. So that is, is, is not uh, very easy with the uh, virtual yeah. education. Yeah, well, it is possible. The social aspect of it, socialization aspect of the student will not be there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah but also easy. another issue is about the accreditation yeah. because uh, I don't know about in Malaysia, but in Iran, when you say that you have uh, graduated from virtual uh, program, 
compared to a, a, a traditional program, uh, people, they prefer to have the, or for example, uh, get hired the, the traditional graduated person, not okay. the virtual graduated person. I don't know right. about the Malaysia. Do you have this culture also? Well, certain sectors, certain sectors, not, not all, uh, mm -hmm. because some universities uh, in Malaysia have been uh, handling online remote uh, edu uh, online uh, education for quite a long time and in terms of quality of graduates, especially graduates uh, who are pursuing education while they're working, for example, mm -hmm. or they have been working all this while and they, they came back for further studies uh, to do the undergraduate, whatever. Uh, they, we have universities that are reputable through um, offering of distant uh, education. Um, but some sectors of the economy prefer uh, those who are uh, gone through a uh, face-to-face. For example, in the professional education, engineering, medicine, dentistry, uh, you need to have a physical, uh, you know, um, so yeah, yeah. Um, uh, in social science and business, humanities, online should, should not be uh, a problem. So there are sectors uh, that would not, that still prefer uh, a traditional form of uh, learning. Okay. Yeah, uh, thanks. Next, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. We are about the end of the session. And just one, um, the last questions to the, Dr. Moshiri. Yes. Uh, Dr. Dr. Mohammed Islahi, thank you for your profound presentations. My question is whether neoliberalism is also, is also a crisis for higher education. Is this really true? Yes, it is indeed. When when public universities, for example, uh, because of a reduction in or a slight uh, reduction in government funding, they have to find their own money. So no neoliberalism has encroached into higher education, which the Iranian, uh, our friend uh, presenter, has said that in Iran, public universities' responsibility is to get educate the population. Yeah, when you have neoliberalism where money is the bottom line, the market is the bottom line. That's the reason why you have a lot of private universities in Malaysia. Yeah, because the government need to cut down on public expenditure for higher education. They allow private higher education to flourish. You have 400 plus public, uh, private higher education system, a uh, private education institution in the system uh, that goes for revenue income genetic. At the same time, you have 20 public universities. You ask the public universities to look for their own money in order to cover the shortfall from the government. So that's neoliberalism. It becomes um, um, a useful tool for the government to cut down on costs, but it becomes a headache for public universities to look for the money. Yeah. The funny thing is, when the economy was good, we were not asked to look for our money, our own money, when the economy was good. I, in fact, that's the time for, for the government to ask us to look for our own money when the economy was good. We can go so many sectors and get the money. When the time is bad, they cut the, the, the funding and they ask us to look for money, which is ridiculous. That is the irony of the whole thing of neoliberalism. When, when the time is appropriate, you don't ask universities to look for the money. When the time is not good, when you have crisis in higher education, that neoliberalism come in, you have to find your own money to cover whatever shortfall from the government. So it, it's, it's kind of um, um, irony for the whole thing. So yes, neoliberalism is a good thing in certain sector, yeah, uh, for the private sector, yes, leave the private sector to live, uh, to guide their own higher education development, yeah. But for the public sector, they have a shortcut in funding, they have to find their own money, and they have to compete with the public, every private higher education sector. And it is a headache. It is a headache. Neoliberalism is a headache for higher education. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dato Moshiri. Sorry, just one more question from Dr. Yeah. Kuratashi. Uh, which program and strategy is the most important for the internationalization of Malaysian higher education? For example, collaboration with international organizations, producing research paper, being published in higher, the high impact journals, running students and professors exchange projects, etc. 
Okay, if we look, if we look at the, the um, domain of higher education, as I said earlier, if you look at um, from the from the economy perspective, yeah, of course, internationalization, mobility of students to Malaysia is very important, yeah, because they bring money. But if you look at the research, uh, it's not so much about money that comes to Malaysia, but it's money, research money to the institutions, yeah. Not to the Malaysian government. Research money doesn't go to the Malaysian government. It goes to the institution. So uh, the institution will benefit from that. When it comes to mobility, short-term mobility program, uh, five students from Iranian universities coming to our university, um, uh, funded by the Iranian university, and five students from Malaysia uh, going to Iranian university, funded by Malaysian university, there's no money in there. Yeah? We're spending money, there's no money, but student gain, each university gain. So it's not one or two or three top uh, program. It's about several programs and several universities focus on certain programs. Uh, in Malaysia, you have research universities. So they focus on research activities, on publication in higher impact journal. But then you have the undeniable of universities, which are not research intensive. But they're very good in teaching, yeah, teaching and learning. So there's another way of internationalization at home through teaching and learning and so forth. There's another level of universities. They are good in community engagement, dealing with community around universities, yeah, uh, in relation to sustainable development goal, for example, yeah, reduction of poverty and things like that, climatic change. Uh, so um, it cannot be said. All universities must be engaged in one, two, three, four, five program. Some universities, program one, program two. Some universities, program four and program five. So we have a range of the domains, yeah, 12, 11 domain of internationalization of integration. But the problem is um, the government need to come together to decide that, yes, we agree on academic collaboration. What form of academic collaboration leave it to individual institution to decide? Yeah, uh, but the framework of academic collaboration has been decided. We explore what we are good in. For example, between RI, PHE, and IPTN, what are good things that we can do? Policy based, evidence based uh, research on higher education. Yeah, as I've highlighted in my few slides. Uh, so that is a point of discussion. Yeah for collaboration. And another important thing is in the case of Iran, in the case of Malaysia, in the case of many developing countries, there's always the need for uh, a middle man or middle woman, a middle agency like EU, British Council, USAID, and so on and so forth. Uh, because we don't have money. We have the thinking, but we don't have money. We don't have resources. We may have the talent, but to move things forward, we need the resources. So in ASEAN, we have a, a, a program that is, in, that is run by the EU uh, in order to bring together ASEAN universities in collaboration with German universities, British universities, and so on and so forth. So collaboration in the context now requires that intermediary. Uh, it's good if Malaysia and Iran can work things together, but if we need uh, other talents, we need additional resources. That's where internal, international agency, it could be the OIC, it could be the Islamic Bank, it could be anything, but resources can come from other third agencies that bring us together. Okay, so um, that's all from me. Thank you, Mr. Professor. Uh, Dr. Nushahi, uh, I think you have a comment. Uh, thank you, thank you, uh, Professor and uh, Dr. Musavi and uh, other participants. Uh, in conclusion, I say that we can have relationship uh, with each other between uh, my institution and your institution, for example, and then force the governments, us, our governments, uh, to have relationships and facilitation these relationships. 
finally, I must to thank my good colleagues, Dr. Tuatashi, for organizing this meeting, and Dr. Musavi for his presentation, and Dr. Qasemi, and uh, Mr. Fossil. I hope uh, this meeting will be the beginning of useful and continuous cooperation with our university and uh, colleges in Malaysia. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation and for your participation. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you to all of you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, all of your participants, dear lecturers, especially Dr. Moshidi, uh, Ms. Dr. Nushahi, and Dr. Musabi. And th thanks all participants. Uh, the session is at the end, and thank you for your participation and time. Thank you. 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 Thank you.